Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. Hey everyone, have you heard of El Nino? Some people call it the single biggest influence on winter weather in North America. But what is it and how does it work? Well, that's the topic for today. And in order to properly get into El Nino, we need to talk about ocean temperatures and weather more generally, just a little bit. Today's guest is, well, me. So I'm not an expert on these topics, but I know the basics and enough to be dangerous. But more importantly, I do have an expert climatologist interview coming up soon, so I think this episode is going to serve as a great primer of sorts for that interview that will probably be out towards the end of the year. Also, I'll work in a little bit of ecology here and there. In fact, the name El Nino has an ecological story that I'll tell you about. And looking ahead, we have more great Nature's Archive coming. We have an episode on wildfire including prescribed burning and wildfire communication. We also have a great guest discussing dendrochronology. That's a big word, but it simply means the science of tree rings. And I have to admit, it turned out to be much more complex and even more fascinating than I ever imagined. There's so much to be learned from tree rings. And do you want to learn about nocturnal nature? The animals and their adaptations to be active at night. That's very interesting, and that's coming up soon as well. And the really big news where I've been spending a ton of time lately is our Jumpstart Nature podcast launches on Monday, October 2nd. This podcast is very different from Nature's Archive, aside from the fact it does discuss nature topics. So here are a few of the differences. Every episode dives into one topic, but it has the help of multiple guests, and it reveals myths and surprises of that topic, all in a concise and entertaining narrative format. So instead of a free-form interview like Nature's Archive, This is actually produced and put together to tell a story with the help of all of these experts. And in fact, our host is Griff Griffith. You probably know him from past Nature's Archive episodes, so you can imagine that he's going to be a great narrator and host of the show. So get ready to learn about the surprising truths of lawns and native plants, why feeding birds may not be the win-win that we think it is, and how you can turn it into a win-win, actually. And we'll learn about the surprising psychological concept that's driving biodiversity loss and how plants and animals need connection and community to survive as well. Lots of great stuff. Can't wait to share it with you. This is our pilot season, is what we're calling it, because we want to learn from you and learn from the audience what you like and how to make it better in the future. I literally have a set of slides with proposals for something like 60 additional topics that I think are all very compelling. I really want to make this work, so please check it out. Our trailer is already up. You can subscribe right now. And once we launch on the 2nd, I would love it for you to leave feedback and share it and do everything you can to help me continue to make these podcasts. All right. If you've been listening to me for a while, you've probably heard me comment on the fact that I'm a little bit of a weather nerd among my various nerd hobbies. And I wear the crown of nerd proudly because I love to dive moderately deeply into topics and really get into the weeds with them. And I think I have a knack for learning. I don't always have that knack for remembering. So this episode was a lot of fun (laughs) to put together because it forced me to dig deep and, uh, you know, remember some of the concepts that we're going to talk about. Living in California, we have boom and bust cycles of precipitation. And for that reason, I'm particularly fascinated with El Nino, which is a cyclical fluctuation in ocean temperatures. And it has a global impact on weather and animals for that matter. And more accurately, El Nino, when we're, when we're talking about this, it's, it's one part of a cycle that is more formally called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, E-N-S-O. Here in California, El Nino events more often than not bring extra winter rains, especially in the southern half of the state. Sometimes these rains can also be quite excessive, leading to flooding and landslides and other impacts. And whether you live in Nebraska or New York or British Columbia or Florida or any point in between, you've probably heard your local meteorologist talk about how El Nino affects your weather as well. And the El Nino this year looks to be a pretty big one. The current forecast says moderate, maybe even strong. So I think this is a great time to explain exactly what this means, because the impacts of El Nino are right around the corner. I think to really get into ENSO, though, I'm going to start calling it ENSO. Maybe I'll flip back and forth between El Nino and ENSO. Um, It's important to first understand why and how oceans play such a critical role in weather. And I cannot stress that enough. Oceans 
disproportionate impact to global climatology. First, did you know that water is actually denser than air? Well, you probably did, even if you haven't thought about that fact recently. I'm sure you know this at least intuitively, because after all, if water was less dense than air, it wouldn't collect in depressions on land and form lakes and ponds and oceans. That's a form of liquid water being more dense. Some of you might be saying, but wait, water vapor is actually less dense than air. And that's actually true as well. And this is one of the amazing facts about water. I, I was actually really tempted to do a rapid fire, like this is why water is such an amazing thing and all of the remarkable properties that it has, but I'll spare you from that. Uh, but water vapor is the gas form of water. It's less dense, which is why when it evaporates, it actually rises into the air. Anyway, back to liquid water, which is roughly, by the way, 800 times denser than the air near the surface of the earth. I say roughly because things like salinity and temperature and some other factors can minorly affect that density. So remember, 800 times denser than air. That's much more dense. This density is an extremely important factor in weather because it means that water can also store a whole lot more energy than air. So the denser the material, generally the more energy it can store. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that. And it takes much more energy in turn to change the temperature of water than it does to change the temperature of air. So here's a simple example. Anyone who's ever owned an outdoor swimming pool or maybe used an outdoor swimming pool probably recognizes that it takes a while for the water to warm up in the spring and early summer. And it might retain its warmth even when the air is cooler at night or like in the late summer when the weather is starting to cool down, but that pool may stay warm just a little bit longer. If like me, you haven't owned a swimming pool, you can see the same property with other dense materials like stones or boulders or maybe even a concrete driveway. It retains more heat energy at night and may still feel warm even when the ambient air temperature has cooled off. This is also why you often see snakes on roadways in the evening. So the air starts to cool down. They want to thermoregulate. They want to transfer some of that heat energy from the road into their body so they can remain active a little bit longer. But that's just part of the picture when it comes to water. Not only is water denser than air, it has this other amazing property where gram for gram, it can store more heat than most other materials on Earth. Yes, water, simple water that we deal with every day. So in physics, the unit of heat capacity, the amount of heat that can be stored, it's called specific heat. And one gram of water has about four times the specific heat of one gram of dry air. Four times. So recall that water is 800 times denser than air and has four times the heat storing capacity. So like back of the envelope math, that's like 3,200 times the heat in the same amount of space as air, at least the heat storing capability. So now imagine, and by the way, that number is not quite right, but it gives you a rough idea. Now, okay, imagine Earth. Take a step back, pretend you're an astronaut floating out by the space station. You see Earth passing below you. And as you've likely heard, the oceans cover nearly 70% of the surface of the planet. So that's the majority of what you're seeing right now as you um, rotate above the Earth as this astronaut. And those oceans, what you can't tell, they run very, very deep. The Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean, is about 36,000 feet deep. Compare that to Mount Everest, the tallest part, which is 29,000 feet tall. So the deepest part of the ocean is deeper than the tallest part of the crust of Earth. Now, some estimates are that the median depth of our oceans are 12,000 feet. That's very deep. It's amazing. So yes, we have a lot of heat storing capacity in this huge volume of ocean water. 70% of the Earth, 12,000 feet deep. It's a lot of water. The deep ocean water is not as warm as the surface of the water, but in turn, you can think of the ocean as a giant heat sink. So they have this capacity to store so much heat on an ever-increasing basis. It can just keep absorbing and absorbing and absorbing. So this is kind of an abstract concept. We haven't really talked about how all this heat really affects the weather. 
So I'm going to start with a real simple example that many people living on the West Coast have probably experienced. So where I live, I'm in San Jose, California. I'm about 25 miles from the Pacific Ocean. And the Pacific Ocean, just for your bearings, it's west of me. And here in the Northern Hemisphere, in the mid-latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, most of our weather comes from the west. So it is coming over the Pacific Ocean towards me. Hey, nature enthusiast, do you want to be part of something bigger? Well, we're building a movement at Jumpstart Nature, and we've just added some new volunteers to help with our podcast and website. But this means our costs are going up too. I need to purchase software licenses to give them access to the production tools we use. For example, one media editing license costs $21 a month. And this is where you come in. Please consider supporting our mission by contributing to Jumpstart Nature through our Patreon or direct contributions, or even purchasing some logo merch. Check out all these options at jumpstartnature.com slash donate, also linked in the show notes. Not ready to make a financial contribution? Then please share this episode with three friends. Sharing what we do is actually one of the very best ways you can help us. Thank you all for your continued support. So it turns out that there are huge ocean currents that shuttle water at continental or even oceanic scales. Imagine the the size of an ocean and there are currents that are flowing and channeling water throughout the whole perimeter or length of that ocean. Along the west coast of the U.S., there's the California Current, which carries water from the cold North Pacific down through California along the coast uh, and kind of all the way down to the Mexican coast. It at times departs from the coast and you'll see a little as a result, some warmer temperatures, say San Diego or, or those areas once in a while. Um, there are some subcurrents, I'll say. But in general, you have the California current taking this cold North Pacific water along the California coast. Since this water originates from far up north, as I, as I said like three times now, it's cold. So the way that people generally measure water temperature is at the surface. They're called sea surface temperatures, often abbreviated SSTs. And the sea surface temperatures near San Francisco, which is just a few miles north of me, uh, but I think a lot of people have a rough idea as to where that is, usually those temperatures range from the low 50s to the low 60s Fahrenheit. Even all the way down in San Diego, temperatures usually only range between the high 50s to high 60s. But like I just said, there have been more and more uh, departures from that in San Diego where 70s are starting to become a summer normal in San Diego. But well, well, you know, for reference, we'll remember high 50s to high 60s is what has historically been normal. Compare this to Savannah, Georgia, which is about the same latitude as San Diego, but all the way over on the Atlantic coast, the east coast of the United States. There's a different current system there that brings water up from the south. So their winter sea surface temperatures are actually kind of similar to San Diego in the upper 50s to low 60s, slightly warmer, not much. Uh, but they balloon into the low to mid 80s in the summer. So that's a solid 10 to 15 degrees, maybe even more warmer in the summer. And it's partly because, as I said, those coastal currents, it's a different system bringing water up from the south. So back to my point. Here in San Jose, our weather comes from over those relatively cool ocean waters, as we just established. They're in the 50s or 60s. Now, this means that in the summer, warm summer air that's traveling over the ocean, it travels over those cool waters and it actually gets cooled. So these systems are coupled. Air and oceans, while they're different mediums, they touch, they interact. There's winds, there's waves, there's things going on there. And what results from that is the ocean will readily absorb heat from anything that touches it, including the air. It traps a lot of that heat. It also cools the air as a result. So the air that comes across is getting cooled. So the side effect of this cooling is that clouds and fog forms. Anyone who's been to San Francisco in the summer knows that sometimes those May and June and even sometimes July, August (laughs) days can feel almost like winter, surprisingly cold, especially right on the coast in the the fog-prone areas. So this fog, it's condensation. And you can see the process of condensation 
very easily. So all you got to do is get a glass of water and put a lot of ice in it. And anything, any air that touches that cold glass on the outside as it's circulating around, when it touches that cold glass, that air is going to cool as well. It's going to transfer its heat to the glass and the coolness will be transferred back to the air. And this is going to force the air's water out as condensation. So slowly little drips of condensation form along the edge, the perimeter, the outside of that glass. By the way, another quick aside, you can also see the inverse of this in your car. If you have condensation on your rear windshield, you can turn on your rear window defroster which is often it's a series of little wires that you've probably noticed running through that rear windshield. Or I guess maybe technically it's a window, not a windshield. But in any event, by heating up those wires, you halt the process of condensation because now the glass is warmer, the air immediately next to the glass is warmer, and air that touches it warms instead of cools. And this also triggers the opposite effect. So not only does it halt condensation, it evaporates the water that is sitting on that glass. So I think that's pretty cool. It's, a, it's an easy way to understand what's happening with fog forming is air is cooling down and it's forcing this condensation, which creates little droplets of water suspended in the air, uh, fog or clouds. So back to the example in my home of San Jose and the West Coast in general. So we have one of the big effects of oceans that I just described, and that's much of the West Coast sees low clouds or fog in the summertime when we have these prevailing flows of air that uh, cause the cooling and cause the fog. So I told you I'd include some ecology here and there. And here's a big one, literally a big piece of ecology, coastal redwoods, the tallest trees on earth. Side note, I was just reading a, a story that was saying that the tallest redwood is 380 feet tall. And when scientists did some math to figure out how tall could a redwood actually grow, the limiting factor seems to be the ability to transfer water through capillary action all the way up to the top of the tree. And the, this study anyway claimed that 380 feet is actually very close to the limit. Maybe it could hit 400 or perhaps 420 feet, but, but very interesting. All right, so coastal redwoods, the tallest trees on earth, there are several plants along the West Coast, including the coastal redwoods, that have adapted over many thousands of years to take advantage of this climatological fog that we see. So using redwoods as an example, they have special leaves that cause the condensed water to drip down to the ground, and then they can absorb that water through their roots. So it kind of like turns the fog into light rain. And they also have only recently discovered, maybe a decade or two ago, it wasn't that long ago, other tiny leaves that have been shown to directly absorb water from the air. And they call this foliar uptake. So in fact, I, I read that they have an ability to absorb water through their bark as well, which is just amazing. Uh, an amazing adaptation that you would only see over eons and eons of adapting to persist in a given climate. So these three processes of basically drinking the fog are all critical to the survival of coastal redwoods. The other piece of the puzzle, if you're not familiar with, with these coastal redwoods that grow primarily in California along the coast, is that California's summer climate is very dry. We don't really get any rain in the summer. Very rare. And we do get this fog, though. So it's, you know, these redwoods have figured out how to take advantage of that. Okay, so we're on our journey of talking about oceans and why they're important before we get to El Nino itself. So circling back to our West Coast fog and low clouds, uh, recall that air has a lower specific heat capacity than water. And land has a lower specific heat capacity than water as well. So on a summer morning, you know, we have this fog that has been pushing in from the coast Land will warm more quickly than the ocean. It has lower specific heat, meaning it can more easily warm up, more quickly warm up. So the warm air can hold more water vapor as well than cool air can. So this warming halts the condensation, just like that defroster on the back of your windshield, and it causes the fog to burn off. So this is a very normal pattern. I'll wake up with low clouds almost every day in the summer, even today here in September, low clouds, and then depending on how deep, uh, how much moisture, how much fog, 
it can take a couple of hours to maybe even until 11 or, or noon or something like that for it to burn off. So I want to point out there are some other factors here. It's not just the California current that causes cool water along the coast. There are certain areas that are even cooler, and this is caused by a process called upwelling. So upwelling is basically deep water rising to the surface. And I'm not going to get, pardon the pun, deeply into that topic here today, uh, but there are certain points where this happens more than other locations. And, and interestingly enough, this cold water upwelling creates a kind of an ecotone of sorts where habitats change very quickly. And it's a usually a very productive part of the ocean where you see lots of life along uh, cold water upwelling areas. Okay, another thing to keep in mind is that once in a while, the weather doesn't purely flow from west to east. Storm systems can kind of get backed up. There might be a blocking high pressure system or different things like that that can create a reverse flow. And when we have these rare offshore flows, we don't get the fog. And in fact, in California, where, where it may not rain for months in the summer, these offshore events can be uh, very problematic from a fire weather standpoint. Uh, because it's pushing all this humidity away. It's allowing things to warm up more quickly. And it is a drying type of wind. So humidities can get to be exceptionally low. Uh, this can really amplify fire risk. So anyway, this idea, this scenario gives you an idea of how ocean influences weather and ecology to some extent. So one more thing about sea surface temperatures before we get to El Nino. I know you're probably like, get to the point. I want to hear El Nino. Uh, so it's currently the peak hurricane season in the Northern Hemisphere. I think this is a great example of a case where people have heard about ocean temperatures affecting weather that's worth elaborating on a little bit, just so you have this, this background. So it's true that warm ocean waters can fuel tropical storms, and tropical storms are special types of storms. They're very different than storms that occur over land. So of course, to get a tropical storm or a hurricane, you need other favorable conditions too, but ocean temperatures are essentially the fuel of the storm. So again, this, not, this isn't a hurricane episode, but the short story here, skipping some details, is that the warm waters can sustain what's called a positive feedback loop in hurricanes. A positive feedback loop means that the system is self-reinforcing, and feedback loops are a big part of climate, and this is a good example. And you can also have, by the way, negative feedback loops in certain situations where instead of self-reinforcing, it's kind of self-destroying in a way. Anyway, remember, heat is actually energy. And there's plenty of water vapor over the ocean. And especially when it's warm, warming air rises and it naturally cools, as we've discussed, when it reaches cooler temperatures and higher altitudes. So this causes that warming, moist water over the ocean to condense. And a side effect of condensing water vapor, this is where the water basically gets forced out of the air, is that it releases energy as heat as well at the same time. And I know it's hard for me to wrap my head around what's actually going on here. If you want to geek out on this, it's, it's called latent heat release. And it's basically one of the requirements of the first law of thermodynamics. <laughs> so the energy of the water vapor converts to heat when it condenses. So we'll leave it at that for a moment. Stated more succinctly, warmer oceans lead to more water vapor, which rises, rem remembering that water vapor is less dense than regular air. And eventually, when it gets high enough, it cools, it condenses, and it releases more heat. So this heat actually powers the storm. So with heat, air continues to rise. Rising air lowers the air pressure. You know these hurricane systems have extremely low pressures in the center, especially. So lower air pressure creates a higher pressure differential. The air pressure that you know changes more dramatically over a short distance. That's what air pressure differential refers to. So the atmosphere wants to equalize these air pressures. So it increases winds because gases naturally want to equalize. They want to uh, come together. The higher wind draws more warm and moist air from the ocean surface from further and further away and more quickly, continuing this feedback loop of water vapor rising, condensing, warming, more winds, bringing more air in, more fresh moisture, more warmth. 
So feedback loops are very powerful. Here's a great example, by the way, of a feedback loop that just came to me as I speak into my microphone. If you've ever been speaking on stage, you'll notice that it can only take milliseconds for feedback in a microphone to create this painful screeching sound. That's when the sound of your voice coming out of the speaker goes back into the microphone, feeding back, causing a circular repeat of the sound. And this is what, why these storms can so quickly build up and also so quickly fall apart when they encounter land or some kind of adverse atmospheric winds that break down the structure, causing the feedback loop. Okay, enough about hurricanes, but I think it was important to have this concept of how warm waters can really power storms as well. So let's talk about El Nino. I first remember my local TV meteorologist talking about El Nino probably around 1990, 1991, somewhere in that time frame. And I, maybe you didn't know I was that old, or maybe I just have an exceptional memory at a very young age, but I'll let you decide that. So as I said before, though, the proper name is El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO, and it's the oscillation that's the key point here because sea surface temperatures oscillate in a very distinct pattern. That's the core of what El Nino is, at least on the surface. So while it took until the late 20th century for El Nino and Enso to reach the common weather vernacular, the effects were actually first documented as early as the 16th century. So this is not a new thing, even if the term might seem relatively new to you. But what is it? So here's an analogy. It's the best I could come up with. Hopefully it gives you at least a surface level understanding. So imagine you have two friends sitting on a huge seesaw. And one of them is named El Nino, and the other is named La Nina, and they're at either end. So El Nino is sitting on the seesaw near Peru and Ecuador, and La Nina is sitting on the seesaw way further west along the equator, maybe out near Indonesia, approximately. And in this case, the seesaw is a very nar narrow strip of oceanic water that stretches between these two people across the Pacific Ocean. When El Nino sits on the seesaw, remember El Nino is near Peru and Ecuador, all the warm water moves towards that area. And when La Nina sits on the seesaw, way out near Indonesia, the warm water moves west and the cool water replaces the warm water back where El Nino is. So in this simplistic visualization, you can see the oscillation here, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. But the sea surface temperatures are more of a symptom of a broader process. So similar to how your fever is a symptom to a systemic infection of your body, that's kind of what we're talking about here with these water temperatures. And INSO, the INSO process is fascinating and complex. And not only that, other factors such as cold water upwelling can turn on and off at various points, either dampening or amplifying El Nino. So there's a lot at play here. So before we get deeper into El Nino, know that I'm not getting into some of these confounding or amplifying processes that are also part of El Nino. Uh, there's so much more to the story. There always is. So let's start, though, by considering what happens in neutral conditions. So we're not in El Nino. We're not in La Nina. So visualize what's going on here. This is kind of the default condition. And in this case, there are persistent winds along the equator that blow from east to west. So for those of you in the mid-latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, this, this might be a little confusing because it's opposite of what we generally experience. So they're blowing from east to west. These are the trade winds, and they're generally consistent in equatorial regions around the globe. And by the way, interesting fact, uh, they're named the trade winds because of their historical importance in sailing, which permitted trade between different groups. So as I said, trade winds are generally consistent and stable. This is because they are largely influenced by the Earth's rotation, which, as you might imagine, the Earth's rotation is pretty consistent and stable, thankfully. This consistent push from the winds literally pushes the surface water more and more west. It's hard to imagine. It's like, really? Winds can push surface water? Yes, it does. It's not just waves. It's even more uh, impactful than that. So it causes water to pile up deeply in the west. There's literally a slope on the ocean surface as a result. That's right. The water is deeper on the western end of this seesaw I was telling you about than it is on the eastern end in this neutral condition. 
And in fact, the water can be meters deeper, especially when, when we have a La Nina event. But even in the steady state, it's deeper. So my view, again, this is pretty wild to consider the ocean can be so much deeper because of the power and consistency of wind. And by the way, there's a term for this slope. They call it a thermocline, which also gives a nod towards the temperature aspect of it. So remember, the warmer water is less dense than cooler water. So this consistent wind is pushing this less dense water on the surface westward in this non-El Nino state, leaving the cooler water behind. So basically, we have an accumulation of deeper, warm water in the western Pacific equatorial region. So depending on where you are in the Pacific, these water temperatures can fluctuate depending on where we're at in the cycle as well, from anywhere from like four to seven degrees Celsius, even more in very rare cases. So that's like seven to 12 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And we're talking about a body as big as the ocean that's all connected. All this water is touching other water. The fact that you can have water temperatures change like that is, it's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of heat that's being transferred. As you can imagine, water is fluctuating in temperature by this much over such a large area can trigger a significant atmospheric response. So meteorologists like to say it's a coupled system. The atmosphere and the ocean are coupled together because they're exchanging heat. And there's all sorts of things that go along with that. Most fundamentally, the winds and the broader circulation patterns that drive storm systems and hurricanes are what is impacted in the atmosphere when ocean temperatures change dramatically. As we said before, wind is the atmosphere's attempt to equalize pressure. Air in high pressure systems tends to blow towards low pressure systems. And that kind of makes sense if you stop and think about it. There's more pressure pushing the air towards the area that has lower pressure that's like pulling the air in, in a way. So the spinning of the earth also adds some spin to these air flows, and there's other dynamics that come into play. But that's the general idea here, is uh, these air pressure systems are trying to equalize. In, in the ENSO neutral condition, warmer water is accumulating in the Western Pacific, and this leads to higher pressure in the Western Pacific. So for a variety of reasons, this steady state default state, neutral state, can stop. The trade winds might weaken for some reason, and there's lots of, again, systematic reasons why this begins. But when the trade winds weaken, it could begin an El Nino cycle. This weakening of the trade winds might allow that several meters deep warm water to come slowly sloshing back towards Ecuador and Peru over its sev you know, it's several thousand miles along that path. In some cases, the trade winds might even reverse, which can hasten this pace. You might be wondering why this warming and cooling occurs over this relatively narrow equatorial strip. This largely has to do with the global atmospheric and ocean circulations, which are driven by the Earth spinning and the configuration of our continents. So we talked about the trade winds, which occur in this narrow strip as well. That's no coincidence. And the other unique thing here is there's this vast area over the Pacific Ocean that's relatively unobstructed by land. So take a look at a map. The Pacific is the largest ocean. And then you go uh, thousands of miles between South America and Indonesia with really no land. So that's, uh, that's why we have this broad area affected so dramatically. Okay, let's take stock of where we're at in describing INSO. We have a normal condition where trade winds blow from east to west along the equatorial region. This vast area of the Pacific with no land obstructions allows these consistent trade winds to pile up water in the Western Pacific. And this water that's being piled up, it's the warm water that has risen to the surface and that's what's being pushed. If and when a disruption to the trade winds occurs, the water can flow back to the east. And this can break various other systems, feedback loops, other things in the atmosphere and in the ocean and speed up the process, possibly even leading to reversing the trade winds and a rapid warming of the ocean temperatures in the Eastern Pacific. Sometimes, remember I talked about cold water upwelling earlier. That's a thing down here too. And sometimes the cold water upwelling in the Eastern Pacific also stops. And that's a whole other discussion as to why and how that happens. I won't get into that now, but as you can imagine, if cold water is no longer moving to the surface and warm water is being pushed back in, uh, that can lead to a warmer condition than you might otherwise have. 
Because the ocean and the atmosphere are coupled, constantly exchanging heat, a warming ocean means a warming atmosphere and vice versa. So depending on where we are in the cycle, you might see warming or cooling of the ocean anywhere along this huge equatorial stretch. Remember the seesaw analogy from before. Now there are a whole bunch of other things that can happen at the same time that can either amplify or reduce this water movement and warming and cooling process. We talked about the cold water uh, upwelling a second ago. There are these things that you can look up that I'm not going to get into today called Kelvin waves, Rossby waves. Uh, there's another tropical oceanic and atmospheric coupling called the Madden-Julian oscillation or MJO, and the list goes on and on. And I have a casual understanding of a few but the depth is really beyond me. I'm not going to go out on a limb and try to explain any of that because not only would it turn this podcast into like a, a three hour podcast, but I would probably have a lot of facts wrong. So I'm not going to do that. But I did want to call out that like everything in earth sciences, we're dealing with a very complex multivariable system. So we have to generalize a little bit. So forecasters are anticipating a strong El Nino this winter and in case anyone's listening to this in the distant future, we're talking about the winter of 2023-2024. So let's look at why they're saying that there might be a strong El Nino and what that means for our weather. In the United States, the National Weather Service is part of the NOAA Agency uh, for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, the National Weather Service has a climate prediction center that focuses on things like this, and they're the authority for INSO predictions. They release a monthly INSO report that anybody can download and look at, and I'm going to link to it, of course. This uh, It's usually around 30, 32 slides, somewhere in that range, and it includes maps and graphics and some interpretation of the current and the forecasted status. So in these reports, you'll see that they look at sea surface temperatures across the whole range of the El Nino band, and they refer to these as like INSO 1 through 4. They keep track of the status and the trends and the models. They look at things like Kelvin waves and other factors that can contribute to El Nino. And from that, they develop a forecast. So the most recent update was on September 18th, just a couple days ago as I record this. And this forecast indicates a greater than 95% chance of El Nino through March of 2024. And the models also indicate a potentially strong El Nino, but the strength of the El Nino is not the full story. Every El Nino is, in fact, different in its strength and its duration. You probably expected that. That's true for most weather. But additionally, the specific location of these temperature anomalies in the ocean can also vary. And we talked about the coupling. So if the location of where the warm water pools the most is different, you could expect a slightly different impact to the atmosphere. This year, we appear to have a more easterly event from what I've read. We'll talk a little bit more about why that's important here in just a moment. So let's talk about what might be the elephant in the room, at least uh, I know for a lot of people it is. And that is, how is this thing that you're talking about that's happening way down in the equator, ocean temperatures in particular, affecting weather way up here in North America and beyond, in fact? And maybe you're formulating some guesses, some hypotheses as to why that is. I gave a few hints already. So I'll just tell you, there's a lot of indirection here. It's not like there's a direct connection between what is happening in, in the ocean waters off of Peru and what is happening in New York. So simply stated, the changes associated with El Nino impact jet stream behavior. You've probably heard of the jet stream. It's another one of those terms that your weather forecaster likes to talk about. There are typically several jet streams across the globe. Most often, there are two in each hemisphere. There is a polar jet that runs closer to the poles and a subtropical jet that runs down kind of in the tropics. And these jet streams, they can move and wiggle. Uh, they kind of move along with the tilt of the Earth's axis season to season. And they can also have ripples and waves that bend. Uh, they can be bent by storms or high pressure systems. They're called ridges and troughs. And the jet stream is also really important to storm tracks. It's kind of like a path of least resistance. So El Nino can impact the subtropical jet stream pretty directly. What you see here is as warm water pools, you can create different systems, thunderstorm systems, things that, that make these little bulges and ripples uh, along the subtropical jet. And this can have a broader impact on global atmospheric circulation. One jet stream changes and everything else changes a little bit as well. 
So bringing the polar jet into the picture here, these changes in the subtropical jet stream can actually pull the polar jet further south, and that will bring storm tracks further south. Depending on where the ridges and troughs are, this can influence the storm track to bring more storms into California and across the southern United States. And in turn, this leads to fewer storms in the Pacific Northwest in places like British Columbia during an El Nino year. So I have a link in the show notes that shows some maps of a typical jet stream setup for El Nino and La Nina. I think this will really help with the visualization. You can see what the trends typically are. So with a further south storm track, you're going over warmer waters with more moisture. You can potentially pick up uh, more precipitation in addition to just having more storms hitting a certain location. So I keep using the word typical, and I want to remind everyone that there are all these other factors that I mentioned. And even in a strong El Nino or a strong La Nina year, the jet stream pattern is never rock solid. It's not like it just stays stationary the whole winter. It will wiggle and move, and you can have some periods of wet or dry regardless. And this is where the nuance of statistics and probabilities really come into play. So I heard Daniel Swain of Weather West. And, and by the way, if you don't know Daniel Swain and you're into this kind of stuff, you really should. He is a climatologist that has a great blog called Weather West. He's pretty prolific on Twitter as well and has office hours on YouTube where pretty much every week he spends an hour kind of answering questions and describing things happening in the world. Very well-spoken, very knowledgeable meteorologist, climatologist, worth following. So his example here, talking about statistics and probabilities, was like, imagine a situation where we say, typically for this setup, we have a 50% chance of above normal precipitation over the winter, a 30% chance of average precipitation, and a 20% chance of below normal precipitation. And to be clear, I just made those numbers up for the sake of example. That is not the exact probabilities that any one location has for the El Nino event this year. So you might hear that. And on the surface, it's like 50% chance of above normal precipitation. Well, that's like a coin flip. What value is there in this forecast? So this is a bit of the nuance. When you compare a 50% chance of above normal precipitation to a 20% chance of below normal precipitation, you see there's a two and a half times more likely scenario that you're going to have above normal precipitation. You could also slice it a little bit differently. Add up 50% chance of above normal, 30% chance of average. And you could say, well, we have an 80% chance of average to above average precipitation, four times more likely than below average. So that gives you a good feel as to how to plan and how, how to expect. These are probabilistic predictions, and they're extrapolated across an entire season, which will obviously have ups and downs. You might start off drier or wetter than expected, and then it changes for the rest of the season, for example. And the other big variable is exactly where the storm tracks are set up for the longest period of time. So some El Ninos tend to focus a little bit further south, such as Southern California, for where a lot of storm systems will make landfall. And others may focus more in the central or northern California. Time will tell. It's hard to say exactly what's going to happen here this year. One of the other unknowns that's kind of unique to this year and unique to some more recent years is that global oceans are warmer than normal kind of almost everywhere. And this is 100% attributed to climate change and global warming. So the northern Pacific is particularly warmer than normal. And again, this is not related to El Nino. This is just another factor. It's not clear exactly how this will impact El Nino. Because again, there's a coupling. So this warmer North Pacific water combined with an El Nino has not been observed before in this exact configuration. Maybe it will kind of offset the El Nino. But it's also possible that this extra warmth over what would be the winter storm track could allow for more precipitation and stronger storms. It's more energy. It's more water vapor. And speaking of Daniel Swain, this is what he's leaning towards at the moment based on his YouTube office hours that I alluded to before. So he's suggesting that there'll probably be a noticeable El Nino event that affects more southerly locations because of this eastern uh, location of the El Nino in general. And there may be some stronger storms than usual because of this extra warmth in the northern Pacific Ocean. 
The other thing that he pointed out is that it often takes until late January, excuse me, late December or January for the effects of El Nino to fully kick in in the Northern Hemisphere. And I can remember the big El Nino in, uh, what was it, 1998. And that was definitely the case. Everyone was like, where is it? But when it kicked in, it kicked in hard and it caused a lot of rain, a lot of landslides, a lot of flooding. Okay, back to ecology for a moment. So if this El Nino impact pans out, as just described, it may mean that areas in Canada that have been ravaged by wildfire this year may actually see a dry winter. The storm track is going to get pushed further south. These wildfires have been occurring at a scale that's just really, frankly, hard to imagine in the boreal forests up there. And some, most, are in very remote and very rugged areas. So believe it or not, there's actually concern, some people think, that some of these fires may actually persist over the winter. They may not be extinguished. And a bit of this is because even though it may get cold up there and they may get some snow, the really carbon-rich peat areas, which can accumulate very deeply um, in some of these systems, can smolder and burn and actually underground retain their heat and smoldering. So without enough rain, that will continue and they can reemerge in the springtime or summertime when the conditions are right. It's pretty crazy to think about. And of course, ocean temperatures are the primary habitat driver of the oceans themselves. So along the equator, marine life is going to dramatically change as the water temperatures change. In fact, one of the most famous early descriptions of El Nino comes from at least as the legend says, Peruvian fishermen. They referred to the phenomenon as El Nino, which in Spanish means the child or the boy. What they noticed was disrupted fishing patterns with the arrival of this warmer than normal water that often occurred right around Christmas time, thus El Nino in reference to the birth of Christ. So here in North America, what can we expect? Well, I just mentioned Southern California, maybe Central California, has a higher probability than not of seeing more rain than usual this year. And those storms may be a little bit amped up from the warmer North Pacific waters. And this storm track will typically also proceed along the Southern part of the United States, like Texas and into Florida, which may see some wetter, snowier, cooler weather as a result. And then as you head North into the Northern Plains and the upper Midwest, it will probably be drier and perhaps even slightly warmer than normal. At least that's what the typical trends show, probabilistically. And the areas that do see excessive rain, of course, this will lead to higher stream flows, possibly flooding in some spots. And these are important ecological processes, even if they are destructive at times. Other areas might see warmer and drier conditions. Again, part of the ebbs and flows in weather that translate into some ecological winners and losers, at least in the short term. Okay, so that about wraps it up. I hope you enjoyed the solo episode. I know that I enjoyed writing it. In fact, you know, let me know if you did enjoy it because I can consider doing some other topics in the future. I don't have tons of these topics where I can just sit down and write out an outline for an episode and speak to it kind of freeform like this, but uh, there are a few and you know, maybe I can do more. And as I mentioned, I included a lot of great links in the show notes that include visuals of ocean currents, jet streams, Rossby waves, and more. And I also linked to Daniel Swain's website and his YouTube channel. Definitely worth looking at. I always learn so much from him. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this episode. I truly hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please share it. It really means a lot to me. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work. So please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. 
We just completed our pilot season, where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring, and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support. So check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.